patients suffering heart attacks and other heart-related emergencies arrive at the Prairie Heart Institute at St. John's with some regularity. And they are treated as quickly as possible because, as the heart professionals say, time is muscle. When an artery blocks, whatever portion of the heart muscle that that artery was supplying now becomes, by definition, starved for oxygen, starved for blood. And you only have so much time. Each organ has a crucial period of time that it can be starved for blood. In the case of the brain, maybe three minutes. In the case of the heart, you probably have uh, you know, upwards of an hour before you start to lose heart muscle that's going to really impact your life. So we have a saying to give some urgency to people. Time is muscle. The more time we spend putting in IVs, sending unnecessary labs, registering, all that kind of stuff, we could be doing something on the front end to restore flow, open up the artery, increase perfusion. That's our technical term, increase perfusion. But what we're doing is we're restoring blood flow. Since the Prairie Heart Institute serves a large rural area, they began a study in 2004 to see if they could shorten the time between the occurrence of a heart attack and the moment when blood flow is restored. They called the effort the STAT Heart Program. So we've had an organized program that is uh, been treating acute heart attacks in what we call a protocol-driven fashion, meaning that uh, you come into the ER and we have guidelines as to how long it takes for you to be seen uh, and identified as having chest pain, how long it should take for you to get put into a room, how long it should take for you to get an EKG, and then how long should it take to make the diagnosis and then come upstairs, in our case, to the cath lab where you can have the heart attack taken care of. And when I say this has been going on for years, actually this network right. has been trying to refine a way to get people sooner and sooner and sooner. And in fact, now people can even identify from their homes in some cases. Right. So uh, the latest iteration in technology, uh, we work with our EMS, paramedic uh, ambulance crew partners, and uh, the, uh, the rigs, the ambulances, have uh, EKGs that are... Uh, can be hooked up to the patient who's having chest pain in their home, in the field, and that can be electronically transmitted to the emergency room and even to the cardiologist who is on call that night. And the hope is that um, we can activate the process, not when the patient hits the emergency room, but activate the process when the uh, EMS crew is in the patient's home. So what that would mean is, in the middle of the night, it takes up to 30 minutes for everybody to assemble and take care of the problem. If we, for instance, gave people an extra 15 minutes of lead time because the ambulance has to come into the hospital, we could be setting up while they're taking care of the patient at home, reduce the amount of time the patient's in the emergency room. And as you know, we've said on many occasions, time is muscle. Right. So if we can shave off 15 or 20 minutes before we open up the artery, I think over the long haul, we'll be... Uh, saving more heart muscle and more lives. Yeah. Now, the, 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 this time that we're talking about, when, when your doctors and nurses get a chance to be ready, that means as soon as a patient arrives at the emergency department, they can be whisked into whatever part of the hospital, and sometimes right. that's the cath lab, isn't it? Right. So, for instance, in the daytime, during working hours, we already have this capability where patients uh, will be identified in the field and actually bypass uh, the emergency room in, in, in entirely, unless there are complicated features. So they'll, the ambulance crews know to come up to the, uh, I don't want to call it the back entrance of Prairie Heart. We have a separate entrance for ambulance crews where they'll come up the back, we'll actually meet them, come up the elevator, go directly to the cath lab and bypass the emergency room. So all the stuff about registering and insurance and those sort of things, we'll worry about that on the back end, we'll take care of the problem. You know, that's a that's something that we can do from daylight hours, working hours. It's harder to obviously do something like that in the night. And that's where I think this activation in the field is going to be crucial to save time. Think about it even beyond the confines of Springfield. Let's say there's a patient who is, uh, lives, say, in oh, you know, halfway between here and Litchfield. And an ambulance crew goes to their home and... Um, Sit and the diagnosis that they're having a heart attack, uh, it may be worthwhile rather than driving 15 minutes to Litchfield and then flying or driving 30 minutes back to Springfield 
make the diagnosis of a heart attack in the patient's home, not necessarily go to the Litchfield ER unless there are complicated features, and drive directly here. In a situation like that, we'd be ready to take that patient as if they were in Springfield. Now, in its 12th year, the StatHeart program has generated an enormous amount of data kept by PERC, the Prairie Education and Research Cooperative, the arm of the Prairie Heart Institute that conducts research and provides medical education. Dr. Frank Aguirre, a Prairie cardiologist, knows this study like the back of his hand. Well, uh, we know from heart attack uh, uh, studies that uh, the longer that a patient uh, uh, reperfusion, that is, uh, the longer you wait to open up an artery uh, from a heart attack, the greater the amount of heart muscle that's damaged and the worse the clinical outcome, mm -hmm. that is, the higher the mortality rates. So the concept of time as muscles became very important, and if we could reduce that process, improve the, the velocity of opening up the artery quicker, uh, that was the ultimate goal, mm -hmm. to try and save heart muscle. The study started with just six hospitals transferring heart patients to Springfield and has since expanded to a hub-spoke model that includes hub hospitals in Carbondale and Belleville. Over the course of the decade where we started with six centers, now we have 34 different hospitals sending patients to one of our three heart attack uh, hubs with patients uh, uh, being transferred anywhere from eight miles to as much as 88, 88 miles, miles away. away. Uh, so we're providing care, tertiary care, uh, state-of-the-art care for reperfusion therapy to patients 88 miles away that wouldn't have gotten that kind of therapy in the past. And you have an enormous amount of data because now you've got all these patients that have received this kind of care, and I think you've got a, you've got a graph here that shows you what... Uh, right, and before we go there, just to, just to expound on this, yeah. you know, you say, well, how big is that heart now? Well, we've grown to, we now have facilities that are transferring to our three hubs from 28 different counties in the state of Illinois. And we have patients, patients that have come from 83, from 83. different counties. That's in the almost state of all, that's 81% of the counties. You that's almost it. the whole state. You wow. Got it. So it's grown exponentially. Yeah. And so when you ask about the data, you say, well, you know what? Uh, uh, you've proven you can transfer people. Yeah. And so, so big deal. <laughs> but, but really, the, the, the real proof in the pudding of any kind of, of, of program. Uh, is what, what are our clinical outcomes? Yeah. Are you improving quality of care? Are you improving enhancing outcomes? And this is basically our data that you said we've collected. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the slide uh, or the data to the to the left, the action quarter four data set, uh, this is the national data set. This is what's going on uh, in the okay. country of patients that are treated very similar to what we're doing. Uh, if you take a look at death in green. Death is green, right. Recurrent heart attack in blue, stroke rates in yellow, and the composite of all three, death, re repeat heart attack, and stroke, you can see that in the national data set, death occurs in hospital about 6.4%. If you look at stat heart, and this is a decade's worth, this is uh, starting from when we were trying to uh, develop this program to now, where yeah. we've come, come pretty good, you can see our overall in hospital death rate is at least comparable, if not better, better, 5.1%. If you look at the composite of all three, death, recurrent uh, uh, heart attack, and yeah. stroke, Again, at least comparable, if mm -hmm. not better, to the national uh, programs. Mm -hmm. In addition to Stat Heart, PERC, the Prairie Education and Research Cooperative, employs 37 professionals engaged in 15 ongoing studies. It also includes Simvacor, one of a handful of core labs across the country that checks images from heart studies all over the world. We are a, a group of specially trained individuals who adjudicate images that are sent to us from studies that are conducted all over the world. So they're looking for an independent review of the films that are done. So they, they send the films to us, we do our analysis, we do a pre-analysis, um, and then we do a post-analysis, and then we send our results back to the sponsor. Since Prairie Heart Institute is one of the largest heart centers in the Midwest, PERC is always engaged in a large number of clinical trials. The majority of the time it's, um, you know, the repeat customers based on our reputation. Um, sometimes uh, the physicians will find out about a study that they're interested in being a part of, mm -hmm. so they will bring it to us and then we will reach out to the sponsor and ask if we can be a part of the study. But the majority of the time the sponsors know Prairie and so they reach out to us with the potential trial and ask us if we would be interested in I being see. involved. I see. So then we reach out to the physicians, ask them if they're interested in being involved, and then if they are, we open that 
that yeah. communication. Yeah, but you, you told me something earlier too, but it, it's interesting. Sometimes a study is just has a lot of sex appeal, you know. Right. It's got pizzazz and people want to be involved right. in that study. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you might just say, hey, we'll be involved in that study, and then you have to find funding for that, That's don't right. you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the, the trials that are very sought after, you know, we go into that knowing that we are going to take a loss and we budget for that. Yeah, yeah, but you want to be involved because that's, right. that's the groundbreaking stuff that Absolutely. everybody wants to be part of. At the heart of the clinical trials are 10 coordinators who find and enroll the patients, then stay with them throughout the trials and follow up with them in subsequent years. Our coordinators, they, you know, we obviously, the focus is to look for patients that fit a particular trial, whether it for a coronary stent, if they have coronary disease, or they need a heart valve because they have um, a valve disease, whatever it is. So we, we understand that on the clinical side, but then we also get to know our patients very, very well, as well as their families. I mean, our, we follow these patients, most of these trials are three to five years in mm -hmm. length, so we follow them for that whole time. Um, and I always tell the coordinators, we're the one constant in these patients' lives. Yeah. Anytime they need anything, whether it's for the trial or for that disease yeah. process, they always call the coordinator because we're their constant throughout how, how, their... How many coordinators are there? Um, so we have eight full-time coordinators, and then we have two research associates. Uh -huh. um, so we have a, a pretty big staff, considering that when PERC started, you know, 32, 33 years ago, it was the physician's nurses that were... Um, doing research kind of on a part-time yeah. basis and now it's... Are, are, they, are they mostly, I know you're a nurse yourself, she She's needs to come on in, I'll, yep. I'll make room for her. Um, you're, no, you're fine. That's fine. You, you, you are a nurse yourself. Yes. And, and are your coordinators also nurses? Yeah, we have a wide uh, variety of skills, backgrounds. Um, so we have some nurses, we have an LPN, um, and then we have some uh, x-ray techs, which most of their um, background is from the cath lab. Mm -hmm. So it makes a very good group um, because the nurses a lot, we know more of the medical clinical background, yeah. whereas the cath lab, the x-ray techs, they know a lot of the technical stuff in the lab that we didn't. So we make a good team, all now, of us working together. I've been together. told that, that these coordinators spend a lot of time at the hospital. Yes, they do. What do they do over there? So um, we, we go over there to see patients. So, you know, our time is split between here and the hospital. So our time here, we do a multitude of different things, be it screening patients for trials, entering data, um, but we're always on call um, for the physicians if they have a particular patient mm -hmm. in the hospital that, or in the clinic that they want us to come yeah. talk to about a particular trial. So, you know, it's a lot of running back and forth. Um, oh, there is a lot of that. See, you, can, you, you can see them running <laughs> yeah. back. And it's a couple blocks, yeah, so you get your yeah. exercise, don't you? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Meanwhile, some of the latest imaging technology is helping cardiologists, known as electrophysiologists, like Dr. John Scherschel, to ablate or get rid of atrial fibrillation, AFib for short. AFib stands for atrial fibrillation. Probably the commonest arrhythmia uh, in, in the population as a whole can occur in people commonly with heart disease, all sorts of heart disease, coronary heart disease, hypertension, heart failure, valve disease, but also can occur as an electrical anomaly in somebody who's totally normal. So we see AFib in age ranges from kids all the way up to no the very, very elderly. And typically uh, patients present with palpitations, rapid, irregular, what we call irregularly irregular. There is no pattern to their heart beating. So you can imagine that is an uncomfortable feeling mm -hmm. if your heart is beating fast and irregularly irregular. It's, it's literally like throwing dice in your chest. It's mm -hmm. tumbling around. Mm -hmm. And patients, uh, you know, that can feel very, very uncomfortable. If you've had a few extra heartbeats, you know, it kind of gets your attention. Yeah. Uh, you can be short of breath because there's uncoordinated activity of the heart. Um, you can be fatigued because there's uncoordinated activity of the heart. So typically patients complain of shortness of breath or palpitations. They take their pulse and it's racing. So what's the first approach? Well, there's two important tenets that we have to make sure of when we treat somebody newly with atrial fibrillation. Number one is what we call rate control. Hey, it's Bring their heart rate down from the 140s, 150s to less than 100 and the symptoms are much less notable in those situations. Rate control. The other important thing about atrial fibrillation is that when your heart is tumbling around in this uncoordinated fashion, 
you are at risk for uh, stagnant blood flow. And if you have stagnant blood flow, uh, you can form clot inside oh, your heart. Okay. So the first thing we do is rate control. The second thing we do is put the patient, if appropriate, on blood thinners. And there's a thought process that goes through the blood thinner decision because there are some patients yeah, that can be risky. Mm -hmm. And actually, maybe a topic for another show, we have actually new technology where in some patients we, just don't, we don't need long-term blood thinners. But I digress. Mm -hmm. So once we've rate control and blood thinners, the vast majority of patients feel better and we leave them alone. But there are patients who are young who don't want to be on medications. There are patients who the medicines they can't tolerate, or there are patients who frankly continue to feel symptoms despite the fact that their heart rate is controlled. And so then we want to look at what if we restore their rhythm from atrial fibrillation, this rapidly, irregularly, irregular heart rate, back to regular rhythm, what's called normal sinus rhythm. And if we are going to put a patient back to normal sinus rhythm, that's where you see shocking the patient. Well, that works. The question is, in many of these patients who shock them, they go back to atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. The longer you've been in atrial fibrillation, the greater the chance that you'll go back to it. So in the past, on patients that we wanted to keep in regular rhythm after we shocked them, we put them on medications, more medications. It works for some patients, but it's only effective in the long run, 50, 60, 70 percent of the time. This whole new field has taken off actually both surgical and non-surgical by cardiologists, isolating where this atrial fibrillation is coming from in the heart and ablating it, getting rid of it. And uh, if you ablate the focus of the atrial fibrillation, you can restore and maintain sinus rhythm 80 plus percent of the time. And so for a lot of younger patients or patients who are intolerant to medications, this has become a new option that uh, reduces their dependency on medications. 34-year-old Chad Taylor of Good Hope is in the cath lab prep area. Very soon now, he will be undergoing an ablation procedure to treat his AFib. What, how did you know that something was going on? Well, um, I was uh, out uh, running. I'd been running about a couple miles a day mm -hmm. for, for, I don't know, almost close to a year probably. And uh, one day I went out, out running and I got about three blocks from home and I couldn't run any further. I was like, well, this isn't right. Was it because you were short of breath? Yeah, I was short of breath. And then um, through the course of the next couple of weeks, I found myself um, being uh, tired more often. Yeah. And uh, finally, um, then I noticed I was having some chest pains occasionally and, and stuff like that and being stubborn like I am I didn't say anything to anybody <laughs> yeah, about typical it. Typical young man, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um but when I finally did say something we went to my doctor and we mm -hmm. did stress test and um when I was doing my stress test they noticed I was going in and out of AFib and um then they wanted a, a halter monitor to put on mm -hmm. and they said that I was going in and out of AFib about twenty eight percent of the time. So when I had that halter monitor on for forty eight hours and so then, and they could yeah. tell even then that you were going into AFib mm -hmm. periodically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what did it feel like when you when you first noticed that it was happening? Did, did was there a sensation to it at all? Yeah, it was um, a little fluttering type feeling, um, kind of uh, increase in pulse mm -hmm. rate, and um, it was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I, I can I could notice, and I noticed it. Um, sometimes it, I didn't notice it, but sometimes. Yeah. And you attribute the shortness of breath when you were running to the AFib. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. they did the stress test, were they actually able to, to tell that the AFib was going on during the stress yeah. test? They mm -hmm. could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So what did they? How did they? What did they do? Refer you to a cardiologist then? Um, actually, I went um, to a cardiologist, and and they went in and did a, a catheterization to oh. make sure that everything was okay, and um, then finally um, he referred me to an electrophysiologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get this a a so you under actually control. got good news from mm -hmm. the catheter, right? You right. didn't have any major blockages. Right. right. That's no. good news. Yeah. At the exactly. same time, now you know that you have to have this other procedure. Right. Exactly. Do you? Do you what's your understanding about what they're going to do today? Um, 
it's it's pretty clear. I know they're going to um, go up through the, the growing and then they're going to use um, like radio wave type things to um, isolate the veins in the upper part of my heart, mm -hmm. to, which will block those impulses, mm -hmm. the electrical impulses to, mm -hmm. to keep it from yeah. going in AFib. So. You optimistic? Yeah, very. It sounds, um, the procedure is pretty clear and the percentages on it are really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. So. Um, I'm optimistic and a any any fear or trepidation at all going in? No, not not really. Good for you. Not really. Good for you. No. I'm anxious to feel better. <laughs> yeah. Get get back to running. There was. He'd yeah. had pain for a long time um, in his stomach area and bloating, and every morning he'd wake up feeling really bloated. Yeah. And I'm not very catastrophic when it comes to medical stuff. I kind of let it go and figure it'll work itself out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, it took my grandfather passing away actually. Um, and his father, my father-in-law, came to the visitation and Chad was talking with him about and what severe pain he was having and shortness of breath and his father came to me and said, Chad really needs to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, we'll go. And so we went and got an appointment. I believe it was the day of the funeral. We went and uh, went to the doctor and she listened very thoroughly to all of his presentation and when we left there, she had diagnosed a gallbladder and a potential heart issue. So then from then we were battling, figuring mm -hmm. out is the gallbladder pain causing the yeah. pain up into the heart or mm -hmm. is there two separate issues? And so through traveling those paths, we found that he did have gallstones that needed to be removed, but then we had to battle the cardiac issues yeah. as well. Yeah. So we were slated for surgery for the gallbladder removal and then the surgeon said, wait, wait, we need to make sure the heart's healthy enough. So then we went That's through that. That's when they did the catheterization, huh? Well, the halter monitor first. Uh -huh, and then... Okay. And the catheterization. Right. And then you got the good news. That of course, there were no blockages, and right. he could have the gallbladder surgery. Mm -hmm. But then you're still left with this, with this AFib. Did right. you know about the AFib at this time? I believe that all came out with yeah. the, the halter monitor and the catheterization. Mm -hmm. They were able to see what his heart was doing. Yeah, so. yeah. Are you, are you on board? with this procedure? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. It's scary, I mean, it's the yeah. heart, it's kind of an important organ. Kinda. So we, <laughs> anytime they're messing with it, but yeah. we're pretty trusting of, yeah. they know what they're doing. I think we were told they do over 400 of these here each year, so with a, a very high success rate, yeah. so we're. Yeah. Dr. John Scherchel is performing Chad's ablation. He's using ultrasound and design software to create 3D images of Chad's heart. Now what we're doing is using the ultrasound catheter to take pictures of the left atrium in real time. We'll take those slices and add them together to make a three-dimensional reconstruction of the left atrium. Go ahead and take that, Ralph. Looks like we're at the appendage at that point. And I just go live there. There's the pants leg of the two left side veins. That's fine. And so we've created a road map of where to go in the left atrium. And all of those major structures have been documented and are kind of established in space. What does it prepare you to do next? So what we're going to try to do is electrically isolate these four blue pulmonary veins from the rest of the atrium. His veins are very electrically active and they tend to trigger atrial fibrillation. And so what we'll do is literally just draw a circle around them with an ablation catheter to try to prevent them triggering atrial fibrillation in the future. The, the procedure itself is literally just drawing a circle around each of the pairs of pulmonary veins. And the left side pulmonary veins are the two blue objects on our map and the ablation catheter is obvious with the red tip and we're just working our way around the veins. The mapping system records our location and also catheter stability and time. So while we're applying radio frequency energy, these red dots appear if we are stably in position for enough time. Currently, if if I'm in a position for five seconds, it will give a point, and then I'll stay there long enough to get a transmural lesion at the tip of the catheter. And we'll work with the way around the rest of this side 
before we go to the left or to the right. And what does it do when you, when you uh, make a lesion like that? Uh, the pulmonary veins are very electrically active and they are active constantly. They have a kind of muscle that will, in essence, squeeze continuously. The heart squeezes once a second in theory and where the two kinds of muscle meet, we have activation of the heart muscle in a way that causes atrial fibrillation. So the goal of the ablation procedure is to isolate the muscle of the vein from the muscle of the heart so the two don't interact in a way that causes atrial fibrillation. Ralph, can you give me an AP, please? Take the right lateral and push it to the left, or left lateral, rather. There you go. Back a little. There you go. Thank you. Doctor, you've pretty much provided all the ablation you're going to for now. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. And every one of those red dots, and there's dozens and dozens of them, are a place where you've applied this heat. Yes. Is that right? How do you know, how are you satisfied now that you have, that you've succeeded? Well, the endpoint is electrical. So if we have electrical non-conduction or quiescence in the vein, we can assume that the signals from the heart don't make it into the vein. If we electrically activate the vein, we can prove that those signals don't get out to the rest of the heart. So even if the vein does what veins do and have all those extra beats, that won't trigger atrial fibrillation anymore. So if we could face, uh, let's go 910 on the lasso. So the green electrograms that are labeled lasso are the electrical activity inside the vein. And what we're doing is activating the vein electrically. And those signals are causing the entire vein to be activated electrically. Those electrical signals aren't making it out to cause extra heartbeats, and what you see marching through is normal sinus rhythm, ignoring what's happening in the vein. Uh -huh. And you can turn off pacing, please. And here we have normal sinus rhythm with an occasional beat inside the vein probably triggered by my catheter sitting in there. Uh -huh. So this is a good thing. What we're looking at is a very good thing. That is exactly what we aim for. Okay. And the heat that you provide by, with that radio frequency is minimal, isn't it? There's not much to it. Well, the energy that's applied will heat up the tissue essentially to cook it, but not enough to cause any significant structural damage. You likened it to a microwave. Very much so. It, it warms up the tissue at the, beyond the tip of the catheter, and the tip of the catheter itself doesn't even have a fever. <laughs> okay. In many cases, this ablation procedure will cure the patient of AFib. And in most cases, the patient, like Chad Taylor, can go home the next day.